Hello and welcome to another episode of Mysteries of the History, where I'll take you on a wild ride into the unknown, the strange, and the mysterious. Like you, I have questions, and like you, I want answers. First, I want to say hi to some people in the live chat. Cosmic Jerry, Mike Spirit, John Martinez, Canoodles, how, Stefan, how is everyone doing today? Last week, we covered the mysterious frozen continent of Antarctica and its many mysteries. And this week, we go northwards to the equally mysterious state of Alaska with its infamous zone of mysteries called the Alaska Triangle with First Nation legends and lore, as well as tales of UFOs, cryptids, disappearances, and so many other strange phenomena. We will be covering that and so much more. But before we get started, let me bring in my co-host, Jimmy Church from Fade to Black Radio. Jimmy, how are you doing today? Hello? How's everything? I'm just going to do the show by myself then. <laughs> Come on, Jimmy. Unmute the, the mic. Oh, no. <sighs> Hold on. Uh, two, two, two. Okay, hang yeah, on. Yeah, you're you're good now, and everything is good. We hear you. No, no, no. I think you're listening to the camera. It's not uh, camera. Let me see here. Hold on. Let me go to audio. Okay, you say you can hear me. I can hear you. Yeah, you're. Okay. You, you, we're hearing your audio through your microphone. Okay, you're sure you're you're hearing this? Yeah. Okay, good. I don't know. I don't know. I think that was Christina on her end, folks. That wasn't me. I just checked my settings. Everything was fine. I'm unmuted. I have meters metering. I have things bouncing all over the studio. And she says she can't hear me. Normally, I'm playing with you. Normally, I'm just... You know, I do that, and it's it's funny. We laugh. Ha-ha. Ha-ha. Christina, are you stressed out today? No, I am doing great, and I'm really excited for today's show. I have so much information written down here that I'm excited to talk about. Hey, uh, so am I. You know what? I get to do this again. Here we go. Another week with a great subject picked by Christina. And, uh, and you know, what's really weird is that... Um, the universe, Christina, uh, is sending signals all the time. And over the last, maybe it's because summer is coming, but over the last couple of weeks, it's all have been, uh, the messages have been snow and ice and the North and South Poles. Those are the messages that have been coming in. Last week, uh, we did a fantastic show on Antarctica. And before that show and after that show, um, I got nothing but these comments from people and emails and things and guests on the show all bringing up Antarctica. And uh, and then after that, or while all of that is going on and we're talking about that, I get the messages about Alaska. And the next thing I know, we're doing a show on Alaska. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you got to go with the flow. You got to go with the flow. So... There you go, like me getting tangled up in my headphone cable. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, Alaska, uh, it, just like for me, and then we're going to go back. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to you in just a second. But um, Alaska, just like Antarctica, Alaska is strange because it's friggin' big and you can't get there. Now you can go to Anchorage or, you know, you can go to, but Alaska itself, you can't, you can't go check it out. You and I can't go and jump on a snowmobile uh, into a snowcat, right? And head a thousand miles into the center of the state. Uh, we just don't have the ability to do that. So the mysteries that happen there stay there. And it's, uh, it's very intriguing and very interesting. And I have been, um, uh, Following Alaska pretty closely for about 30 or 40 years, uh, going back to some of the reports uh, that 
uh, were going around in the 80s, the 70s and the 80s, about different Air Force uh, squadrons landing on the ice and and photographing and shooting film of flying saucers on the ice that were there uh, for different reasons. And th these reports, uh, Wendell Stevens uh, talked about this extensively, and I've always been intrigued. And the different large events, and we're going to talk about Japan Airlines, but the other large events that have happened um, uh, that, that I've discussed on the show uh, the pyramid uh, up there, uh, a sphinx that is there, uh, the, the local newscasts broadcasting about this, the different bases that were uh, military bases that were all involved in this. It's uh, And then you've got Bigfoot, you've got Yeti, you've got the crypto. Uh, you know, it's, it's everything is up there. Do you remember the movie The Fourth Kind? Somebody just posted uh, that in the text. That movie was pretty fantastic yeah it, it it really was and and that caused quite a buzz you know in the ufo community and and everybody talking about the film and the film itself is a lot what we're going to be talking about today but that is there's been disappearances and abductions and et and ufo activity going on up there all the time the the question is why well i would say just like Antarctica, it's very remote. And if you're going to go and hang out and and want to be unseen, that's the place to do it. So now, where did you get your interest in Alaska? I think kind of looking at Antarctica, I know that there were some kind of, there's a lot of lore connected to Alaska. I've seen quite a few TV shows on the History Channel that relate to the mysteries of Alaska, such as um, Alaska Killer Bigfoot, Missing in Alaska. The Alaskan Triangle, I think, is another one. And I've seen quite a few of them. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, it's in the United States. We need to cover this, which kind of blows my mind that it's only about 55 miles away from Russia. And that's pretty close. Um, <laughs> yeah, Keith, thank you so much for the super sticker. And, and you know, people don't realize that, how close Alaska is to Russia. So that also kind of caught my attention. But let's jump in straight to the facts. So Alaska is America's 49th state, and it is twice the size of Texas. It hosts 17 of the U.S.'s 20 highest peaks, and it also has a lot of volcanoes as well. It, is over, it has over half the nation's federally designated wilderness and an estimated 100,000 glaciers. People have gone missing in the region at a rate of about four people for every 1,000 individuals, which is about twice the national average. Some animals native to the area are bears, moose, lynx, which are Alaskan wildcats, and bald eagles. So with that out of the way, I think now we can really do a deep dive into kind of all the mysteries that happen in Alaska. And you're right, a lot of it is not inhabited. Again, I mean, it it is the largest national um it has the largest national forest in the united states and it holds over what half half of the nation's federally designated wilderness as well so just from that alone you're able to kind of visualize how much of it is just uninhabited if russia because it used to be russian right if russia had a crystal ball or thought about that if you think about it that would that would be Russia up there right now if they didn't sell it to us and not knowing the future. And that's a that's a and, and how important Alaska turned out to be, uh, not only strategically because but because of its resources and it's a beautiful state and everything else. And it is a virtual land bridge uh, to the United States and, and to North America. Uh, that could be Russia, but it's not. It's now part of the United States, and it is huge. There's another strategic importance uh, to this, too, as well, because uh, Alaska, their airports up there are a huge refueling hub. 
And the reason why it's a refueling hub is because of the commercial air traffic that goes over uh, the top of the earth and then comes back down. They refuel there and and continue on to China and Japan and 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 so forth, even Russia. Um, and the cargo that goes through there and the shipping industry and the importance of what Alaska is. And then you have this land bridge uh, that goes down through the Bering Strait. And the last islands there, like you pointed out, are you can see Russia. You can see Russia from there. Um, underneath there are internet cables and and lines that run. And that has been one of the hot spots. Most people don't know about this. Um, in the world for spying, spy agencies. So the United States and Russia, uh, they're down there with submarines and and deep sea divers cutting into these cables and putting listening devices on it and intercepting uh, uh, messages uh, and diplomatic stuff that is flying on those uh, undersea cables. And that all goes down right there. And we have the ability to do it because we're right there on the border of Russia. And most people don't. Uh, uh, not only do they not know that this goes on, and it goes on every day. It's a, it's a game of cat and mouse between the United States and Russia. But how close the United States really is to the Russian border. It's fascinating. It is. And it's something that I never really considered until after finding that information. I didn't realize how close it is. Mark, thank you so much. It says, Christina, I like the clip of Jeremy Corbell you showed a few days ago. You are incredibly talented and well-spoken. Thank you. I hope you will be even more famous <laughs> as Mr. Corbell and Mr. Knapp on the UFO topic. Well, we will see. And <laughs> Xavier says, how do you say it, Jimmy? Tasaka. Tasaka. And, it, you know, look, <laughs> you're going to have to fight the ego of Corbell and Knapp uh, to, uh, you know, they're going to fight for, for UFO supremacy to their last breath. But... You are better. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. You. You're really good at what you do. By the way, everybody, I'm wearing my Warren Central High School t-shirt today. Nice. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm looking at it right now, and it's, that's what that is, Warren Central. And uh, that's what's going on. I'm in a great mood. Okay. Now. Well, uh, Gregory says, sorry for being late, and what have I missed already? LOL. Well, first of all, thank you. We haven't missed anything. We're just about to really dive in and get started. So far, we have covered the facts of no, Alaska. No, 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 no. Stop right there. That's not what you say, Christina. Okay, here's Broadcasting 101. Okay. All right. You missed all of the good stuff, and we can't go back and repeat it. You need to go and watch the – no, the best stuff already happened. We're in cruise control. That's what you do. Okay. I, I made a mental note. I made make a mental them, note and I'll do that again. Make them pay the price for being late. <laughs> okay. All right. Where do you want to start? <clears throat> well, I think let's start with probably one of the most famous attractions to Alaska, and that is the Alaskan Triangle. Now, this was first named in 1972, which honestly is not that long ago, 50 years ago. And the area began attracting public attention in October of 1972 when a small private plane carrying U.S. House Majority Leader Hale Boggs, Alaska Congressman Nick Begich, and aide Russell Brown and his Bush pilot Don Johns seemingly vanished into thin air while flying from Anchorage Anchorage to Juneau. No evidence of the plane was ever found, and the men were declared dead after a 39 day investigation. At the time, conspiracy theorists claimed the disappearance was orchestrated or covered up by then FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover in response to intense political struggles he had with Boggs. To this day, no traces of the plane or men have ever been found. 
afterward, more planes went down, hikers went missing, and Alaskan residents and tourists seemed to vanish into thin air. In fact, since 1988, more than 16,000 people have disappeared in the Alaska Triangle alone. On average, about 500 to 2,000 people go missing a year just there. Insane. So it That's is. Insane. That's insane. If if that uh, and 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 I've spoken about this before. If that same number was going down in Los Angeles, in Kansas City, in Dallas, New York, Miami, Chicago, you know, Scottsdale, Arizona. If that number was going down, it would be uh, not only an outrage, but you would have the entire state, all law enforcement, everything involved in this and politicians and everything else. That is a crazy number. I mean, yes. that's if you think about it, you're walking around a shopping mall, you know, with 5,000 people in it, right? So you're saying that 15 of these people are going to disappear, just poof, right? <laughs> that you're walking back. That's a crazy, huge number. It is. And while I guess in here's kind of just some context to kind of grasp those numbers. Well, like if you're looking at regular statistics, 500 to 2000 people a year might not sound like a lot, but those are people that go missing and are not found. Right. Like, right. like that is the key thing. These people are never found. A lot of the times um, when people go missing, their bodies are either found, uh, they're, they're able to return back home and things like that. It's about what I think 5% of all missing people cases is when people are actually lost forever, can never yeah. be found again. Yeah. So when you put it like that, those numbers seem a lot more significant than just saying 500 to 2,000 people go missing a year. Oh, okay. But when you look at it, that's only about, what, 5% of people that are never, ever found. You're like, wow, now that's extreme. Yeah, it's it's a crazy big number, and there are a couple of cities. Um, now I'm looking at some of the comments here in in the chat. Uh, not true, Jimmy. Consider all the missing Indigenous women and girls. Absolutely, and and there are segments of of society where the the numbers are higher, and it's there's no excuse for it. I I totally get that, um, but when you look at Alaska and specifically a few cities, when the uh, when the movie the fourth we just talked about the fourth kind when the fourth kind came out, these stats started to surface uh, with these uh, three or four cities in Alaska with the that. amount of disappearances uh, that were happening, never to be seen or heard from again. I was I was just blown away. So yeah, Alaska has got more than its share. There's there could be a lot of reasons for it. And and I've I've read some of these, um, but the other part uh, is it is that we have to look at is it something paranormal? Is it abductions? Is it uh, aliens? Uh, yeah, there's the fourth kind right there. That was a, that was a really good movie. It was a trippy movie. I for people that haven't watched it. I recommend it. And what's really interesting about this movie in particular is that one, it does take place in take place in Alaska. But what's interesting is that you're getting kind of like two different views of the movie. You're getting the documented version and then you're getting the reenacted version of it. So I think that they did a really cool job in incorporating those two types of vibes into the movie. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And the Alaska Triangle. Um, which this movie would be the southern part of uh, where this takes place and, you know, the southern coast of, of Alaska. The Alaskan Triangle isn't small. It it takes up a big chunk of the country. And when you are a country, yeah, I guess we could say that. Big chunk <laughs> of the state. And, uh, but, it, but it's a huge area. And when you start to, yeah, thank you. And uh, so it goes from Anchorage to Juneau all the way up to Barrow, uh, up to the top. That is a lot of land, and that is a huge area to cover. And when you start to, uh, you know, put push pins into this map 
uh, to the different significant uh, occurrences and events. It's uh, it's insane. And they do fall in within the boundaries of the Alaska Triangle. Um, now, the other part uh, that I was mentioning earlier, uh, so I can specifically talk about uh, Japan Airlines. Japan Airlines, uh, just scroll down just a little bit. So, No, no, bring the map back. Bring the map back. Bring the map back, the Alaskan Triangle. Okay, and bring it up. Yeah, that's that's enough. That's perfect. So everybody look where Anchorage is, okay? And uh, there's a huge airport there. Um, and it is a hub for just about every major airline and courier service freight in, in the world. And they all pass through there. Now, Japan Airlines was coming um, from the Northeast at an angle down and had to fly through uh, the Alaskan uh, Triangle and land at Anchorage Refuel and then take off and continue, which is what everybody does. But you have to go the airspace there. You have to fly through that uh, to get to Anchorage. And with these plane disappearances and everything else uh, that happens and these sightings, they happen there because of the air traffic uh, that is going through. It's a it's a very important point uh, to bring up. The Alaskan Triangle is big, and it covers the approach and, and takeoff, the landings and, and the departures of these flights that are going in that direction, you know, at an angle over uh, the, uh, uh, what, what do you want to get, the Arctic, and, the, and then and continue on over to Europe. And let's talk about the Japanese air airplane flight 1628. For those that don't know the story, Jimmy, we have covered the story before, but for those that haven't heard it, let's just kind of revisit that. So in November of 1986, a Japanese airplane was transporting French wine. And at around 5 p.m., when the Boeing was flying over northeastern Alaska on its way from Paris to Tokyo, it saw something that could only be classified as unexplained. Captain Kenju Terat Terachui was Tasaka. <laughs> no, no, that's not it. <laughs> was an experienced pilot, and he noticed two strange, brightly lit craft below and on the left to of, of his plane. As the Cold War was still in full swing, and due to Alaska's close proximity to the Soviet Union, Terauchi, that's how you say his last name, assumed these had to be U.S. military planes who regularly patrolled the Alaskan skies. However, he soon came to realize that the craft were following him. And several minutes later, the craft suddenly, suddenly appeared dead in front of Flight 1628. Their light beamed so brightly in the cockpit of the plane that Terauchi claimed he could feel their the warmth on his face. And communications from the plane to the control tower on the ground were also affected periodically, becoming scrambled with interference and despite the object lying steadily in front of the plane radar operators could not see anything in their systems which is kind of a recurring theme in ufo sightings especially when it comes to pilots so as this craft was getting closer to this airplane, Terauchi began to notice that this looked like a mothership, and he described it as being as large as two aircraft carriers. Mm -hmm. But by the time that air traffic control um, aircraft had launched two planes to investigate the claims from Terauchi, the objects had completely disappeared with no trace of them whatsoever. And what's incredibly compelling about this story is not just his sighting, but what happened after he told people about his sighting. And most pilots are kind of shy to tell their stories, but Terauchi was pretty eager to do so, him and his co-pilot. 
so much so that he took it to the press and then the Japan Airlines removed him from being a pilot and instead gave him an ordinary desk job. So, Jimmy, again, we've covered this story before, but why do you think that is? Why do you think his title was stripped from him from being a pilot to just getting a desk job after telling his experience? Well, because he told the truth. That's why. And uh, and, and there, there's no question about that. The event itself, and thank you for that, because uh, you you just deal with the facts. But let me let me do the color commentary on this a little bit, if I may. Please In do. That, this wasn't a craft. This was like a frigging planet. It <laughs> was the size. Now he describes it as you know shaped like a walnut with this ridge that went around. Um, absolutely huge. Okay, now two aircraft carriers wide as well as tall, with other craft that were involved with it too as well. But that's a significant part of this. It's not a, you know, it's not a flying song. You know, it's it's this walnut-shaped giant craft. The event lasted for 50 minutes. Planes were scrambled out of Elson Air Force Base. Um, and and the, the sighting, again, lasted for 50 minutes all the way from the border Going down that approach pattern that I just spoke about earlier, you know, trying to get to Anchorage, and they're coming at an angle um, uh, across uh, Alaska, entering Alaskan air, uh, airspace, where this happens. Now, all of the radar was saved. So you have the official version of this and the press release. Yeah, two of those. Two of these. I mean... To see, uh, look at all these little jets. So you can just kind of imagine how big two two of those two cities, right? Okay, so um, and th- so the official part, no, nothing was seen. No, we, we didn't catch it. We uh, that's not true. And so uh, the FAA sends their lead investigator. He goes. He sees it. He gets uh, the radar data. All of it is there. And he became a whistleblower and and came out and spoke about this case and and, and how and what and who moved um, in the airspace. And, yes, this object is there. And not only did it back up the two pilots' accounts, but it just shows how a cover-up can happen. And one of those is, you know, pull these guys out of the public eye. Let's get them off of the planes. Let's give them a desk job. Let's get them out of the way. And that's what they tried to do. Um, the, the case itself is not only officially document, uh, documented with all of the uh, uh, radar data, uh, but you have the pilots uh, from Elson Air Force Base, you have the contact, and the sighting lasted all the way from uh, the border of Alaska all the way through to Denali. And uh, it's a 50-minute long sighting, and it's extraordinary in Alaska. And while we're on the topic of airplanes, there's another incident that happened in the Alaskan Triangle in the 1950s, and it's practically dubbed Missing Douglas C-54. <clears throat> Sky Master. So in the 50s, there was a military aircraft carrying an eight man crew and 36 passengers. Mm -hmm. The plane lost contact with the ground and was never heard from again. There were two separate reports of UFO activity in the area at around the time of the disappearance. One UFO sighting was seen a week before, and then another one was seen about two days after after the disappearance and uh, the military ended up conducting the largest sorry the army ended up conducting the largest military search and rescue mission at the time and found nothing to this day it's known as one of the largest groups of military personnel to go missing it's a fascinating case it's a fascinating case and it kind of and if you think about it, like what happened in Fort Lauderdale um, in 1940, 
48, uh, close encounters of the third kind, right? Okay, so uh, when you think about it, it's very similar to that. Yeah, okay, there you go. This one's part of the Japanese, uh, kind of um, what people think this mothership might have looked like in comparison to their Boeing. Yeah, that's plane. That's for those that are just now tuning in. That's the cool stuff we just talked about that you missed. And Christina just wants to make sure that uh, everybody uh, uh, gets uh, the same information. Think about that. I mean, look at that illustration. And it's just fascinating. I've seen this so many times. And uh, it's great. Okay. So uh, back to the Sky Master. Um, it disappeared. Is it? Is it a case of, I'm just going to say it, people will think it, but I'll just say it. Is this an abduction? Uh, was was everything just taken? And is it, is, is it somewhere else? Will it be returned later in Close Encounters of the Third Kind Part 2 coming out next year? And, and the, the, uh, the search and rescue, they, they, two of these happened. Uh, we're talking about Alaska right now, but two of these happened uh, nearly at the same time, almost in the same area. The other one was in Seattle, Washington. Same thing, 1954. Skymaster flying in in uh, uh, in the mountain area in the snow um, outside of Seattle disappears. And and it now you would think so. Same thing, search and rescue. One, you know, they're going to say this is the largest search and rescue that the army has ever done, and they had the national guard involved. Never found the plane. Never found the plane in Seattle, right? And it's the same thing with this is Alaska. This isn't, uh, you know, Africa. This isn't uh, someplace that's outside of the United States. We're talking about Alaska. And we could never find the plane or the crew or any signs of anything. Same thing happened in Seattle right at about the same time. Also, with UFO sightings happening uh, that week um, in Seattle. So, yeah, there you go. This is crazy. And here's how the Sky Master looks. My, you said, what if it was an alien abduction? And I'm thinking, what if they entered a portal? I sure. mean, many people believe yeah. that the Alaskan Triangle is just like a ginormous vortex because by many, it's believed that it sits on a ley line. So could it be that that area, that triangle, kind of like the Bermuda Triangle, it's just kind of a, a very thin veil that things can enter and exit from that necessarily are, that don't originate from here it's a possibility okay, because again not even the airplane was found christina so yes. you That's and me. i we, we got a private plane we're up investigating we're cruising around alaska right we got our bush pilot you know you're sitting in the front i'm in the back and uh and we're cruising around and then suddenly in front of us a door opens right and we're looking at it. it's a vortex and we, do we tell the pilot to go straight? Heck yeah. Tell the pilot to go straight. Do, do we <laughs> fly through it? Do you do it? If if I'm able to see the other side, no, probably. Is, why, why do you got to be a politician? Are you running for office? Do you fly through it? Do you go, you know what? Dude, I don't know what they're paying you. I'll double it. You're taking Jimmy and I through that let's go do we go absolutely that's what i'm go talking big about. or go home that's what i'm talking about i always and make sure to pack snacks so we'll be fine go pack snacks got ramen we'll travel um because go. uh this isn't uh an isolated thought christina there have been reports of this numerous times and i don't think that it's just uh, if you're a pilot, if you're a pilot, that means you've gone through the training and you've passed and you've got your license and, and you've got your air time and your time with the stick and, and you're out there, which also means though, that probably you have a pretty good family, a pretty good life, uh, education behind you, you're stable, you appear to, right. What? So pilots, 
that talk about things like this, vortexes and missing time and time travel and and UFOs and this Japanese. This is a Japanese commercial pilot, right? The military. Um, I, I don't think that they're making this stuff up. There is a phenomenon that is that is happening out there, and I haven't experienced it. I'm here now talking to you. I haven't experienced it, but given the opportunity, I'm going for it. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that plane right into it. I, I honestly think that there is something going on. We don't know vortex, time travel, parallel worlds, some interdimensional thing that is opening up. We don't know these things. But they're happening, and and that's the fascinating part for me. You can't have military planes just disappear in in uh, 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 Alaska, may be remote in parts, but the plane took off. It took off from an air base with military professionals on it. It just doesn't disappear, and they do it. It's it's a fascinating subject. It is. It is. There's something going on. Absolutely. Daniel, thank you so much. It says, love the content, Christina, and then a thumbs up. Thank you. So now let's kind of shift gears from UFO sightings to Bigfoot. And in particular, let's talk about Natinak from Portland, Port Lock, Alaska. And how I got my information originally was watching the series called Alaskan Killer Bigfoot. It's a pretty interesting series, and we're going to get into that. But let's actually talk about the the history behind Portlock. So the earliest descriptions and accounts of Nantinok can be traced back to European expedition logs in the 1700s. In the early 20th century, as Portlock's population grew, local and national sources began to record unexplained occurrences in the area. An abnormally high number of disappearances, catastrophes, and deaths eventually led to villager elders to move to a nearby town. In addition, various groups of hunters used to head to the mountains for their work, and some of them never came back. But these accidents were not uncommon, and nothing was proven until 1931. In that year, a local woodchopper, totally alone in the forest, was found. The man had been killed by a single ferocious blow, far more devastating than could than could have been inflicted by a single human being. This incident was scary enough to traumatize the entire village. And keep in mind that this village was pretty small like yes it was growing but it was still a pretty small population where everybody knew everyone so the fact that you had one wood chopper just totally just punched like so hard that it could not be explained of course that that can scare anybody's and bodies were found mangled and torn up in a nearby lake and bodies showed signs of being pulled apart by force and some of these bodies that were found were armed hunters so they are knowledgeable on how to interact with wildlife but there is very little, if any, evidence of normal wildlife, let's say bears, to completely rip up human bodies, right, uh, without yeah, eating must. them or things like that. And so, and so, overnight, everyone left Port Lock, and it yes. became a ghost town. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, Christina won't let me interrupt her anymore. She'll talk over me. She she knows I'm trying to jump in, and she just nope. She ignores. And she stays focused. I love it. Is is this? Um, let's not. The one thing about this case uh, that it, those loggers, those timber, uh, the timber industry, the, those are tough people. Yeah, you have to be uh, tough. Tough. It's heavy. Right, uh, it's not that. I mean, they're not scared <laughs> of anything. They're not scared of anything. They're dealing. I mean, those these are tough. Uh, tough people, and for them 
to be terrorized, right? Now, there were reports. They couldn't sleep at night. They were losing sleep. They knew that on the fringes of this forest, people are, are, are dying, they're getting murdered. We've got some, uh, you know, this this ape creature uh, knocking us off one by one. And it got to the point where, and this was a cool little town, making money in the logging industry, everybody split. And it's still abandoned today. Um, I've heard so many attempts at debunking this and, and uh, there were uh, different, you know, there was a serial killer amongst them and these different ideas that that were laid out there. It doesn't matter. Those, those uh, uh, that industry is not shaken. They're dealing with wolves and, 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 and bears and, and things that are trying to eat you every single day. They just <laughs> deal with that, right? They freaked out. They yeah. were getting taken off one by one and uh, talk about don't go in the woods. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going no, in the no. woods. No, <laughs> no. You won't I'm find me there not. at night. But, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned that there were rumors that it was a serial killer. And just by thinking about murders, like finding bodies, you know, coming into shore. Sure, that's understandable. But there were a lot of things happening in this village that simply did not make sense. People could hear roars, howls, wood knocking, which is pretty yes, prevalent yes, with yes, Bigfoot. Yes, 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 then you, then they have um, these, these shadow-like creatures, because, you know, it's dark, they can't tell, coming close to the homes and towns and throwing boulders and rocks at incredible distances. Yes. And what's even more interesting about Port Lock in particular was that even to this day, which is again shown in the TV show, if you enter the forest, you can see trees pulled out from the ground and turned upside down. And Don't these are like big trees done, done can you imagine you know you just had a long day you're logging you're chopping things down you're cut you're bruised you're hurt you're sore you're tired and you get to the warmth of your cabin and you're eating dinner and then you got to deal with thump you know and everybody's like no i ain't i'm not gonna go check <laughs> you know and they're listening to this all night long and you've got to get up and see who who didn't make it through the night. And they just got tired of it. And everybody left town. It's a true story. I don't know what was behind all of the killings. Um, but if you're going to freak out a logging town to the point where everybody just packs up and 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 leaves, yeah, they, they, they were scared. Something was going on. It's a fascinating case. It, it became a ghost town in 1949, officially. They were like, we can't handle this kind of terror right. anymore. It's, it's, right. it's us or them kind of mentality. Either we try killing this thing or we're leaving. And apparently this the natives ended up calling this creature Nathinak, which is similar to a Bigfoot, but a little bit smaller, about eight feet tall instead of like a typical 10 feet tall. And what's interesting about this is that the natives in the end, kind of believed this is not merely just a regular flesh and blood mammal-like creature, but it's almost supernatural because what they had stated is that those that are kind of near the proximity of Nathinak or if, if, the, if this being just didn't like certain people, the villagers could end up getting strange illnesses. There were smells and noises that have been recorded in, in the port lock area with no known explanation and it was kind of that after those pieces of evidence that the native said i don't think this i don't think we're dealing with anything typical it has to be something more supernatural now we're coming towards a break jimmy we will be right back after this Hi, I'm Micah Hanks, and let me tell you something. I support Christina Gomez as a Patreon subscriber, and here's why you should too. She brings all of her unique insights to a whole new generation, and all while she's also going through college. Listen, support Christina, become a Patreon subscriber today. You won't regret it. Hey there, it's Christina. 
Did you know you can get access to an exclusive extra segment of additional questions and answers with all of my guests, as well as behind the scene videos and photos? Ever wonder how I turn my small college dorm apartment into a studio where I can shoot new videos or set up lighting and backdrops for my show or what camera I use? Yep, that video is there too, where I explain as I go along and also give the story of how I learned to do special video effects and editing. You can get access to all of that and much more by joining my Patreon supporters club. You'll be helping by supporting this channel, my research, and production costs, as well as investing in new shows coming soon. Starting from as little as $5 a month, there are several tiers you can choose from that suit your budget, and each tier carries extra perks and benefits. Join my Patreon club and become a supporter today. Welcome back. With me today is Jimmy Church from Fade to Black Radio, and today we're talking about the mysteries of Alaska. We were recently just talking about Nanti Nock from Port Lock, Alaska, but there are some other Bigfoot sightings that have happened in and around the vicinity as well. Jimmy, before I continue, do you have any particular stories of Bigfoot that you want to cover that happens that uh, happens in Alaska? In, in Alaska, um, not not specifically. Uh, I, I don't, but let's talk about, let's go back to knocky knock for a second. Absolutely. Just like that portal, right? I I've got tickets. I got a boat, Christina, you and I can go right? and, 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 and pull up and, uh, and go check out port lock and like set up camp. Do you go? Absolutely. Yeah. That's just- but in in the summer, I I, I don't really like like right. dealing with the cold and humidity next to the lake. I'm gonna pass on that. But if it's like warm and nice and temperate, 100. percent It's a pretty fascinating ghost town. It's uh it's it's unreal. I would I I, I would dig it. I I really would. Um, now you know how to fish, Jimmy? Just in case. Uh, yeah, I can fake my way through it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I can open I up don't. a can of tuna like nobody's business, though. I can tell you that. Um, I can murder a plate of sushi. I can do that too, as well. But, um, but I would love uh, to go and 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 just check it out and and see what is going on. I know that there's been some investigations that have happened up there, and you know, pretty fascinating things. But it's real. It exists, and it's a place that you can go to. I would love to go check it out. Um, uh, I wanted to, can, can I pick the next one? Go for it. Harp. Okay. Harp. We got to go harp <clears throat> and the, what, uh, uh, I'll, I'll let you get into the facts of the case here in just a second. Sounds good. When I first started, um, fade to black uh, there, uh, over the years, I see this ebb and flow of subjects and, and, you know, and I get the emails and, and, and people commenting and, and things. Um, but when I first started fade to black harp was like a, a big deal in, in our community and a lot of questions that were there. And, um, visually it's pretty trippy, uh, the entire setup. Um, the stories behind it, you have the official government version of what Harp was, which is scary. Just to, even if you buy the government side of it, it's like, what are you doing? And then there's everything else, uh, the conspiracy side of Harp. Um, just a fascinating subject that everybody is still interested in. What was Harp, Christina? I'm about to pull up a picture first so let me let me do that so people can kind of get an idea of what it looks like and then i'm going to read you actually exactly what it says from the black vault so here is the picture or a picture of potentially what harp looks like you kind of have all of these stands and let me read you so on the black vault it says the high frequency active auroral research program harp is an iospheric research program jointly funded by the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, 
Navy, the University of Alaska, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as DARPA. Designed and built by BAE Advanced Technologies, BAEAT, is <laughs> its purpose is to analyze the ionosphere ionosphere and investigate the potential for developing ionospheric enhancement technology for radio communications and surveillance. The HARP program operates a major subarctic facility named the HARP Research Station on an Air Force owned site near Gaikona, Alaska. Now there's a lot of interesting conspiracies when it comes to harp and some of the main ones is kind of capable of modifying weather disabling satellites and exerting yep. mind control yep. over people yep. and that is what's being used again by these conspiracy theorists as weapons against terrorists so some theories blame the program for causing earthquakes, droughts, storms, and floods, diseases such as the Gulf War Syndrome and Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, and the 1996 crash of uh, the TWA Flight 800 and the 2003 destruction of the space shuttle Columbia, as well as the earthquake in Haiti. And what really caught my attention on this particular subject was that even Hugo Chavez, the 64th president of Venezuela, who ruled Venezuela for about 14 years and turned and, and brought socialism to the country, had also stated that HARP is a weather manipulating piece of technology. And he comments, and it's later recorded by the Spanish newspaper ABC back in 2010. And he goes ahead and he states that the United States Navy induced the Haiti earthquake using a weather weapon, accusing the United States of playing God. And it, he then goes and says the U.S. Navy launched a weapon capable of inducing a powerful earthquake off the shore of Haiti. This time it was only a drill. And the final target is destroying and taking over Iran. So, you know, these again, these are all conspiracies. And, and by the way, but um, they they have been doing the rounds for a long time this topic of harp and even the fact that hugo chavez had had touched on this as well until his death in 2013 it makes you question how how is he able to get this information or how is he able to come up with this conclusion if none of this information is really publicly available the conspiracy starts with every <clears throat> corporation and branch of the military, uh, uh, an agency that is involved with HARP. Every conspiracy that you can think of, BAE systems, uh, the Air Force, the Navy, DARPA, uh, uh, on Air Force land, you look at what these uh, antennas are and how they look. And then what the stated purposes are for, you have got everything that you just mentioned is a possibility uh, with this. And it could it be all of the above? Um, it just one of the most intriguing parts is like MK Ultra is this mind control? Are we beaming into people's heads? But and just in its basic form, <clears throat> excuse me, blasting holes in the ionosphere. That's its job, right? Blasting holes in the ion. What are you doing, right? So is this weather manipulation? Is this weather control? Um, one of the uh, ultimate weapons that you could have. It's not a nuclear bomb. No. You know what a, you know what a really good weapon is? Stop rainfall in a country. Give them 10 years of drought that that's a weapon that's a real weapon and is this uh, uh some of the research behind harp now harp is what we know of uh, a location that we know how are there other uh, uh spots or other locations um around the world where this harp technology has been installed and used 
just as a weather manipulation device. You know, and when you go and you blast a hole in the ionosphere, this is heavy voltages. This is just crazy. You're messing with Mother Nature. And then you turn around and you look at, is there a possibility of earthquakes here? Sure, I would think so. Um, is there uh, the possibility of interfering with uh, flight control systems like uh, the space shuttle or airplanes? You're blasting these huge, powerful radio waves up into the sky and, and blasting holes in the ionosphere and, and doing it for research, trying to figure out what's going on. And then when you tie in the other aspects of this, that could it get into the cranium of humans? Could could this affect people's thoughts, uh, thought patterns, and and everything else? Is there something else uh, that is is involved here? Uh, the heart program is is crazy. It's crazy, and I say this all the time. This is a crazy subject. This is harp to me is nuts. And if you need to control a situation, I think you would easily control it through the weather and you're not flying airplanes over. You're not bringing new military in. Uh, this isn't stuff that can be reported on the news. No, you're doing it through the weather and who would ever think that you could control, uh, control that. And that's the part from harp to me that I think is based in fact, Christina. It really is a bizarre topic, and it is hard to avoid when talking about Alaska. There are a few other places that are pretty interesting and are merely speculation and or believed by conspiracy theorists, one of them being Mount Hayes. Could it possibly be an alien base? From Nick Redfern's articles on the subject and books, he states that Pat Price was one of the most skilled of the U.S. government's remote viewers of the 1970s. He was someone who regularly used his psychic abilities to spy on hostile nations for various military and intelligence departments. So according to Pat Price, the aliens that lived deep inside Mount Hayes were very human-like, different only in their hearts, lungs, blood, and eyes. He adds that the site has also been responsible for strange activity and malfunction of U.S. and Soviet space objects. So, you know, th there is very little known about this mountain and, and if it really does harbor an alien base, but it is something worth mentioning. I mean, why would a government funded remote viewer say there was an alien base in Alaska to begin with? Is it possible disinformation to get people off the trail of something else? Mm. Or is it true? I mean, I, I find this story definitely a, a stretch. It's very interesting. And it also does have a, a history of UFO sightings as well in that area of Mount Hayes, actually that whole mountain range. And we're going to get into that a little bit. A little bit later. I mean, e even the local First Nation tribes mention some pretty weird things happening in the mountains and saying it has to do with the sky gods. Yeah. And uh, now this is we can't really uh, talk about this without getting into who Pat Price was. And Pat Price uh, in, in um, and I've talked all, uh, most of uh, and interviewed most of the remote viewers in in that project uh, with SRI, and all of them say the same thing. Pat Price was probably the most gifted remote viewer ever, and uh, after the program, okay. So just let me say this: Pat Price went on to work exclusively for the CIA. The CIA knew how good Pat Price was. Pat Price, in the end, was taken out, and he was murdered. And Pat Price knew things, and he was the most gifted. So when Pat Price remote views Mount Hayes and talks about alien bases, from anybody else, it's whatever. You know, good story. Yeah, cool. Right on. All right. 
It's Pat Price, the most gifted remote viewer who was 100% employed by the CIA. Pat Price, uh, there was another part uh, to Pat. Pat also knew his gifts, and he was a rock star, and he knew this. He, he lived a rock star's lifestyle. He had an ego. He talked about the things that he was doing, and and he let too much out to the point where he was absolutely uh, removed. He was silenced, and, and he was taken out. Pat Price was incredible. He was the rock star of remote viewers. That's why this case with Mount Hayes and the remote viewing there, um, it's, this isn't just it's somebody that claims to be a remote viewer with an alien story of an alien underground base. It, you know, it, that's not what this is. This is Pat Price specifically talking about Mount Hayes. And yes, we do need to take note of it. Pat Price was incredible, incredible. He definitely was. He, he, like you said, he was very incredible. He was very incredibly gifted. Bob, thank you so much for the super sticker. And John aside, isn't there a pyramid in Alaska? And we are going to cover that right now. Yeah. So in that same mountain range where Mount Hayes is, there's another mountain called Mount McKinley, and it was renamed to Denali in 2015, which that kind of, I was like, why would you rename a mountain after so many decades of having one name? What was the reason? I couldn't find that, but that was like, hmm, I really, I really questioned that. I know, well, I think we all did. Yeah. It's, it, 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 it'll always be Mount McKinley. Oh, without uh, a doubt. All of this. Uh, but yeah, it's now called, uh, 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 is it Mount Denali or is it just called Denali? I think it's just called Denali. Right, right. Yeah. So in 1992, Channel 13 Anchorage reported a news story regarding an apparent discovery of a huge pyramid buried underground about 50 miles from Mount McKinley. The story stated that three scientists, in anticipation of a nuclear test by the Chinese government, had set up seismic recording equipment around the area by pure accident, they discovered evidence for the massive structure below them. The piece may have the the piece may have gone unnoticed, right? The the um the Channel 13 Anchorage reporting, but the story goes that a retired military member had watched this on television and 20 years later in 2020 2012, he allegedly told that he knew of the structure to Linda Moulton Howe. Another witness by the name of Bruce L. Pearson from New Jersey stated that a pilot had informed his father that the pyramid was not man-made and that it was indeed a power generator that was thousands of years old. It could generate enough power to power not only all of Alaska, but most probably much of Canada as well. And then another person came to the front lines and he's only referred to as the 46-year-old adopted son of a retired Western electric engineer. And he claimed that his father had told him that a dark pyramid did exist in Alaska. And what's more is that his father had worked on a powerful electrical system inside it in the early 1960s. And again, Mount Hayes, where we had what we just talked about a little while ago, and Mount McKinley are on the exact same mountain range. And I'm like, that opened my mind thinking, what is going on inside that entire mountain range, and I'm going to share that picture with you right now. Here is where we're looking. This whole section right here. You're having both mountain peaks, and it's about this far from Anchorage. Pretty far away. About two but... inches. About two <laughs> inches from from Anchorage. Um, uh, is, is is it my turn? Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. I have to ask permission. It's Christina's show. And uh, I have to ask permission. Is this 
when this story started to break, now it's not just the pyramid. There's also the conversation of a sphinx being there too, as well. And you you touched upon the newscast. So the the story behind it's pretty complex and it's pretty rich. But here's the deal: serviceman taking a break. Right. He's in, I, I think he said like he was in the lunchroom and he's watching the news. And the news is about that. And and he goes and he talks to a couple of other people. And and I think uh, some people saw it, some didn't, so, you know, miss the news, you know, that kind of thing. But it was like mental note to self. And it was something that was never forgotten. When they went to the news station to get to to resee it, um, they go back and the videotapes that aired of this segment were gone, and they they were never recovered. And there were stories behind that and who showed up and how the tapes, you know, and. And 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 things, but it's a part to the story that I've always found really, really fascinating, Christina. I I don't think that somebody is making this up. Um, you know what they saw on the news, and then of course the local military base finds out about this, and uh, a, a private uh, uh, television station has the right to do what they want to do. Somebody went in and pulled those uh, videotapes of this new segment out of and removed it from the TV station. And that's what um, this in large part is what set in motion all of the other investigations and other people coming forward about this location in Alaska. Here's the other part. Um, yes, I, I, I believe, I don't want to speak, um, uh, about specifics here because I don't have those in front of me, but there were joint military exercises that went up there. There was an established base camp that was up there. And I think all of that is part of the record. Now, what were they doing at that location? Don't know, but it did happen. And there were, uh, military exercises and, and, and a base a camp, if you will, that was established in that area. Um, uh, the the reports coming out of the 1960s, right? And uh, different civilians up there working on this ancient power plant. Are these true? Well, they all point back to the same location. And if we back back out of it, there was a newscast and a news report that was done on this. So, yeah, I, I think that there's something specific. And then you have uh, the reports of uh, the military finding a sphinx next to this pyramid. And isn't that interesting? That is. Can you go into more detail on that? I, I oh, You would have to go back to Fade to Black episode 658 from 2015. And it is titled The Alaskan Pyramid. Yeah, I uh, I did a bunch of shows on this and and Linda's research. Okay, uh, I, I, I will say this. Linda on Fade to Black. She's going to be with us tonight, by the way. Uh, Linda is back on uh, Fade to Black tonight. And we're discussing more snow and ice. Uh, we're going to be doing Antarctica tonight. Um, Linda says that her research points to, check this, 600 million years ago in Alaska. 600 million years. And so when you talk about an ancient power plant, Linda is referencing uh, through her research, throwing about a number, 600 million years. Now, we think about this, six uh, didn't you and I just do a show on uh, uh, continental drift, right? right? We did. Uh, oh, yeah, Antarctica. Yeah, right, 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 right. I do too. I, I, I know. It's confusing. I, you just keep me confused. See, it's, it's, it's your job. So much stuff that we cover, right? Okay, so 600 million years ago, where was Alaska? See, we're picturing... 
right? Mount McKinley, right? This, you know, the, the Denali region of uh, Alaska and the snow and the wilderness and the frozen tundra and the polar bears, right? That That's what we have in our mind. 600 million years ago, that's not where Alaska was, right? <laughs> Specific, you know, and, and so Linda uh, points out, and this is right after the Cambrian explosion too as well, that this was a tropical area. Now, it would explain a lot about, you know, uh, the possibility of a sphinx and a pyramid and construction, but this was uh, quite possibly just a, a tropical uh, area uh, with green vegetation, and it was different back then. But she mentions the 600 million year number, and that is crazy for us to think about when, you know, Homo sapiens sapiens, 200,000 years old, 150,000 years old, how long we've been here in our modern versions of ourselves, and then you throw in 600 million years, well, that's that's before the dinosaurs right this is this that's a very 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 long time ago again focused on the region that you're talking about right now that number is very difficult to conceptualize marty thank you so much it says fascinating topic thank you again christina and jimmy and i agree i think this topic has been such an interesting topic to cover and to research and to talk about with jimmy Let's kind of look at some of the legends in Alaska. There's one in particular. I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is really cool. And it is called the Kushtaka. And this is a mythological shape-shifting creature capable of assuming human or otter-like form. Yes, yes, yeah. This is great. Continue. <laughs> I is... see I see you all excited. That's just too cute. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yep, 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 let yep, me yep. let me share my screen let me share my screen okay so this is a pretty interesting one and there have been some more recent sightings on this and that's why i'm bringing this up but first of course we need to go with the background story before we get to the sighting so here is one depiction of how this creature could possibly look there have been a few depictions that i've looked at and they all look completely different so here's one of them, and I'll show you a few more a little bit later. But back to this. We're running out of time, and let me yeah. let's see the other images. Okay, well I have to pull them. I have to pull them up. Ah, can I do it like this? Oh, there's another one. Yeah, yeah, there. Yep, 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 yep. Sounds yep. pretty creepy. Yep. So this shape shifting creature can assume human or otter like form, or in this case, you're getting a little bit of both. And they share the same kind of nature and appearances as the skinwalkers as well that we can possibly see at Skinwalker Ranch. And some have been reported as demon like, others as close to being kind of otter like Yeti types. And What's interesting about this is that Paul Dale Roberts tells a story of an encounter on on a website called Unexplained Mysteries, which he just recently wrote in 2021. And it states, quote, many times I assisted the Alaskan state troopers and there was one trooper that told me he was working inside the Alaskan Triangle and heard a woman crying for help. The trooper ran over to where he heard the woman and to his shock and dismay saw an odd large creature about five feet tall and had an otter's face. The trooper pulled out his weapon just in case this creature made any ag aggressive moves towards him. And then the creature then made a high pitch whistling sound and moved quickly towards the water and vanished. The trooper believed that this creature was Kashtika. Now, many legends tell of the Kashtika emitting a high-pitched three-part whistle in the pattern of low, high, low. And some legend says that this creature can lure women to the rivers with screams of babies. Then it makes the choice to transform them into fellow otters or kill the person and tear them to shreds. But what's more to that story is um, there are, when it comes to this, there it's just kind of conflicting on their behaviors. 
Some believe and some tales say that the Kushtika is a very cruel creature and it plays tricks on the sailors, causing them to die. However, in others, they are very friendly and helpful to the sailors, as well as villagers, and even saving them from freezing waters. When they are saving people, the accounts tell them, the accounts say that the Kushtika will transform the dying person into an otter as well, giving them the ability to withstand the cold and make it to safety i love mythology it's like one of my favorite topics of all time i love otters <laughs> they are cute i They're love very otters. cute i love otters and the the mythology behind this uh yeah that is just fantastic um and and if you ever get a chance and and you go to monterey bay California. That's like the 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 otter capital of the world. They're everywhere, and they have them at uh, the, this entire thing in the uh, aquarium. But but otters are cute, and otters are smart. Do you know that otters will take oysters, put them. They float on their back, right? They put the uh, the the shells on their chest with rocks in each hand, and break them open. Pop 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 and then eat the oysters right totally cute and then you but when you're looking at the otters and you know about this it's crazy i just look at otters oh they're not as cute you know as you think that they are but they are pretty cute they're pretty yeah. cute uh, and there's otters are the ultimate <laughs> they are the ultimate cutest animal next to pandas yeah, There's <laughs> pandas are adorable. Straight up, straight up, straight up. Straight up. <laughs> they hold hands when they sleep. Did you know that? Yeah, so that they don't drift away from their families. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They uh, they hold hands when they sleep, as the you know in between abducting your babies. Yeah, that that part makes them a little bit less cute, but mm -hmm. it's really hard not to want to cuddle them. There is another myth that ha that's um, a part of the Alaskan lore, and that's about mermaids. And it's a human-like creature. Let me pick up the picture. It's a human-like creature that lives in the sea with long hair, green skin, and long fingernails. The myth is that these types of mermaids wear this type of uniform, as you can see right here, and it has a pouch to where it can carry children. So they take babies and children away who disobey their parents. And the story was used to prevent children from wandering off alone. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would be taken and placed underwater forever. Right. And what's interesting about these specific types of mermaids called the Kalupalix is that they make a very distinctive humming noise. Therefore, they can be heard before they appear, kind of like the sirens, in my opinion. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and, but what's very different about these types of mermaids is that they're not pretty. I mean, they look definitely terrifying. Look at that face. These are not like the pretty sirens that we get, but we're getting these, yeah. these kinds of more yeah. monstrous like creatures. Mm -hmm. And there have been a few sailors in the Alaskan Triangle area and, you know, as long with the uh, Alaskan Gulf that have encountered these mermaid type beings. And they can be recorded back into the 1600s by the name of Henry Hudson, who was an explorer. And he had stated near the Russian waters, which, as we know, Alaska is only about 55 miles from Russia, he himself encountered a type of mermaid. But the way that he explained it was that it was very ugly. It wasn't like the ones that he had seen in drawings, especially at this time in the 1600s. You would see mermaids when looking at maps. That was kind of the drawing, usually in the corner. You would see a beautiful woman mermaid. That's but right. when he had encountered one himself, he was like, this is nothing like what's drawn that I've ever seen before. And that's kind of one of the first recordings of this type of creature seen around the Alaskan waters into the Russian waters. Yes, mermaids are real. And which completes the mystery. We've never seen Christina Gomez's feet. 
could yeah, that's she never going to happen. Yeah, could she be a mermaid? Could she be a mermaid? I think mermaids are real. Um, now I cool. don't. I'm totally okay with this. I'm totally okay. The mythology uh, when we uh, uh, look at the history of of sailors, this goes back thousands of years. This isn't some new thing. And the sightings of mermaids go up into ship logs uh, uh, right through the modern era. Is there something to it? I'm not here to suggest that there's nothing to it, right? It's too easy to just blow this off. I'm okay with believing in mermaids. Um, if we go back uh, through history, and we're talking about Alaska right now, but if we go through history, there's always something there to protect our children, right? There's some story. There's a crazy lady lives in a cabin in there. Don't yeah. go in the woods because she's going to cook you and 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 put you in a pot, right? Okay. Well, that keeps, but there's always something to the story though. Right, it it's the, there is a woman living in a cabin, and she is a witch, and she does live back there. It's um, the same thing uh, when when we're talking about uh, mermaids. There's something else to it. Um, I think Columbus had stuff in his uh, ship logs, um, and and other explorers around the world that that spoke about these sirens and these mermaids uh, that that were seen. I'm I I. I just think that there's something to it, Christina. I really do. I just find them so fascinating, especially as a child. We have the movie The Little Mermaid, right, with Ariel. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I want to jump into right. the ocean right now and look for mermaids right. and, you know, have them become my friend. But that never happened every time I entered the ocean. So I was kind of heartbroken. But now I've, I've come to terms with it. And I'm just like, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't totally understand if i were them i would not want to interact with humans either so is jimmy sober look i'm okay with the, if if we go back throughout history and and we we look at mermaids or or leprechauns or or fairies and and the little people it's in every single culture on every continent everywhere period. So what is it that it's not imagination? It's not. It's based in reality from somewhere. I just don't know what it is. I always go back to, um, uh, man, I, I'm not going to uh, take the time to tell everybody my fairy story today, but I've got a fairy story. And after it happened to me, Christina, don't laugh. Don't no, laugh. I'm, I'm excited. I love it, fairies. I'm it, not it, laughing at you. It freaked me out, man, the, this fairy thing. And so before that, it, the word fairy, you know, coming out of a man's mouth, it doesn't make any sense. But you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with it now. What I went through was a, a, it was an experience and it was a head scratcher and I can't explain it. And now is it fairies? I, I don't know, but if we talk about leprechauns and the little people and things, and and we uh, immediately look at, in a modern sense, aliens, alien greys, green Martian men, or whatever it just may be, uh, there was a way for different cultures, different towns, different groups to deal with a subject that they didn't understand what was going on. So it gets identified as a mermaid. It gets identified as a siren. It gets identified as a leprechaun, right? And and uh, and and if we just take a really serious, sober look at this, thank you, is Jimmy sober? That maybe we now can uh, start to answer the questions what these different cultures were experiencing and talking about for thousands of years. And I'm okay with that. Is it fairies? Is it leprechauns? Or is it ET? Right? And and I'm okay. I'm I'm okay. Yeah, I'm completely sober. When it comes to these types of lore and legend, these types of beings, fairies, mermaids, they're the same kind of characteristics throughout 
all cultures. So it does it does lead you to the question, are they real? How are all these different cultures on all different parts of the world recording similar looking creatures, Bigfoot, fairies, mermaids, and things like that? So again, I, I personally love these kinds of stories that I used to listen to as a child. And I like to do in my, in my free free time, which I do not have. But if I did, Legends and lure and myths is like my favorite thing, but I'm not knowledgeable in it. Before we continue, we only have a few minutes left. I do want to tell a fairy story. Oh, God. When I've never seen one, but when my father and I used to like walk through the forest, I would always, you know, when you're looking at tree trunks, a lot of the times, not all the times, but I guess sometimes you see this kind of hole in the center, right? Uh-huh. And in a lot of cartoons a lot of the movies at the time they're like that's where fairies live and all these creatures and their portals and i'm like yep heck yeah they are so i would always look for them when i would ever go hiking as as a small one and even today i still look for them and i'm thinking fairies uh glitter dust like where are you at and i would always ask my dad and i'm like dad so is this where fairies come from and he used to tell me he said yes but they only come when you're not looking Right and, right. and I find that so magical. And, you know, even even to this day, as an adult, it makes me question, is that true? Could it be? Could it not be? We simply don't know. But having that type of childlike curiosity, it yes. does bring a lot more color to the world where you're you allow your mind to have fun and, and to be free. And, and there's so many of these so many of these mysteries are are the same so many cryptids and things like this and and i find it just enjoyable well C- christina all right this isn't my fairy story but i'm going to relate i did see this okay uh this is what happened um i'm sitting in a, a lawn chair right lady comes up to me sitting with some friends and she goes, um, and in front of me is a tree about 50 yards away, right? This very, very nice tree. And she comes up, she goes, you want to see my fairy picture? Right? I said, uh, sure. <laughs> fairy picture. She goes, I took it right over there by that tree. And I look at the tree. And I'm like, okay, let me see the fairy picture. She pulls it up. There's the tree. And next to the tree is this uh, ball of light, like an orb, right? And I'm, I see the tree. I'm looking at the tree. I see the tree in the cell phone. And she goes, yeah, yeah, zoom in. So I, right, zoom in on the picture. And in this orange orb, I'm not making this up, folks. In the orange orb is friggin' Tinkerbell. No. Like this, right? Standing with the light and 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 wings, Tinkerbell, blonde hair, frick, in this picture on her phone. Now I'm looking at the tree, right? I'm looking at the phone. I'm sitting in the lawn chair, and 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 I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm like, what the heck? It is the crazy. It, I'm talking about Tinkerbell. And so I, you know what I did for three days? What? I walked around that tree. What did you say to her, though? The woman that showed you this picture. You know what? And uh, uh, somewhere I have it. I never posted it because I lost contact with her in in that I don't want to post it out. It's not my picture to post and, and it's hers. But I saw it on her phone. But this is what I did for three days, man. I walked out there by that tree with my phone. I was ready. And I'm out there going, come on, fairies. It's okay. Just just show. <laughs> man, it was crazy. And and for me to say this, right, to say this story out loud, I realize how crazy it sounds, people. I do. I honestly do. I saw what I saw. You know, and and the picture was incredible. I saw the tree. I saw it. it, it yes. But did, did I get my own fairy after that? I didn't. But I was convinced enough. I'm just telling you that this six foot tall 
strapping man was out there chasing fairies. Man, I'm out there with my phone. <laughs> I'm just out there just, just hoping for the moment because I saw it with my own eyes. And I I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I just know the fairies are real. And 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 I haven't met one yet. Yet. Keyword. Yeah. yeah. Yet. Oh, what a fantastic way to end the show. I I enjoyed this. Talking about fairies, I could do it all day. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't know who Rick is. There are no Tinker Bells and uh, unless yeah, look, man. I I I I I don't care what people think. I don't. I, I really don't. So, Rick, good luck on your journey, though, if you're just going to close off the world. It's pretty boring. So so there you go. Thank you, Christina. Tonight, I've, I've got to jump, everybody. I've got Linda Moulton Howe on the show tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Ant, uh, Antarctica and uh, Spartan 1 and Spartan 2. Christina, you're going to be there. It's going to be another fun night on the show. I'm going to go get ready for that. Christina, great show tonight. I'll see you next week. I'll see you tonight on the show, but I'll see you next week right here. Absolutely. And good luck today. All right. How did you enjoy the mysteries of Alaska today? We covered a lot and a lot of different subjects when it comes to Alaska. It almost makes me question, how can one state hold so much? Dan, thank you so much for the super sticker. I do want to say that I really enjoyed how the show ended talking about fairies. It's it's really a hit or miss. Either you believe them or you don't. But regardless, it, it does awaken this like child joy inside of me just thinking about it. And we can think about the movies Peter Pan and Tinkerbell, just like how Jimmy mentioned. It just those possibilities of magic and, and fairy dust. It just makes it so much fun. I want to say thank you for all the super chats, all the super stickers, everyone who joined this live stream live. Thank you for all my YouTube members and Patreon supporters. None of this could be possible without you. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Mm -hmm.